All right. Is it recording on y'all ends? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, it shows it's recording. Okay. Uh, welcome to the Alabama Spacecraft Consortium Spacecraft Seminar Series, the Introduction to Spacecraft Engineering. I am the Chief Engineer, Michael Halverson. Today we're going to talk about what spacecraft do, what they don't do, how to build them, uh, how they fit together, and let's jump on in. Um, so we're going to talk today a little bit about the overview, what spacecraft are. Uh, we're going to talk about some orbital mechanics stuff, how to physically uh, build them, the, the the structural integrity of them, how to control them thermally, a little bit about C and DH, command and data handling, what the brains of them do. Telemetry tracking and command is how they communicate uh, with both the, the ground, the mission operations center, uh, guidance navigation control, that is attitude control in space, and as well as sensing, and a little bit of navigational propagation in between updating your state vectors and electrical power system, how we provide power, how we distribute it, how we generate it, and then we'll cap it off with a little bit of flight software. So to start off, there are lots of different kinds of spacecraft out there. Anything that orbits is considered a satellite. And you can have uh, vehicles, those are you know your launch vehicles that include humans on them. Uh, satellites can be uh, small sats, which is gonna be the, the majority of the, the discussion today. O OMVs are orbital maneuvering vehicles. And then you can have uh, fabricators, which build stuff in space. That's not so much small sats. And we're starting to see some mining ro robots and in-space manufacturing so that's a lot of fun there's things that land on other planets uh as well as things that drive you know uh, the mars perseverance rover and finally we have uh mars ingenuity helicopter which is a really cool thing not so much a uh, satellite but first aircraft on space but today we'll talk about the small sat aspect of it they are divided into classes and mission types so you can have them for a lot of purposes and the classes is really who builds them is this something that is done for public good um, that would be something like a, a NOAA a GOES satellite GOES uh, for weather observations you can have commercial satellites that's going to be your your orbital reef uh, in space manufacturing the military obviously does quite a lot with spacecraft and any university class CubeSat is generally for education purposes. It barely matters if it flies, but we're, we're here to teach and learn. And the mission types for small sats in particular, uh, you can have some that for communications, you can have optical laser communications, uh, imaging different parts of Earth, looking for fires, looking for uh, plumes of, of some kind of gas. Um, the military does use small sats, particularly for reconnaissance observations, but small sats also do science really well. That's something that not a lot of other larger satellites can fit such a high value into the small platform. And they're also used to test out technologies that ha perhaps haven't flown on larger spacecraft before. So why do we do them? Why do we care? They're, they're much smaller. Why not just build the regular satellite? So they they're much cheaper for the mro it was 416 million the lunar reconnaissance was 580 80 million uh in the first 10 gps they're not this expensive anymore but they cost about 600 million dollars and a a small satellite can be developed for under a million dollars if you have the right funding if you know what you're doing it could you can do just as much science as a large satellite used to be able to do, but in a much smaller platform. You can fit a bunch of them onto a single rocket. So you're gonna save a lot of costs on uh, ride share, on just having multiple on a rocket. You can see that in the Tyvek fit check there, all of those satellites can go up on a single platform. And finally, there's an entire ecosystem develop, uh, dedicated to small satellite infrastructure, to for onboard computers that fit within a CubeSat form factor um, EPSs, uh, gene and C components that they all fit really nicely. And because this is standardized and the economy of scale is taken over, it's way cheaper, which goes back into that cost savings. So in order to have a spacecraft program that uses one of these small sats, you need to have a mission. That's a really important first part, obviously. Uh, that is defined generally by an operational concept. That's the what and the why. And we'll talk about that during the introduction to systems engineering portion uh, in at the next spacecraft seminar series. And a concept of operations, which is how and to what end. So how do you accomplish the what? And 
to what end? What's the ultimate purpose that accomplishes the why? You're going to need to have a strong management structure. If it's science mission, you have a principal investigator, but in general, you're going to need a project manager, um, a lead systems engineer, chief engineer, and if it's a large enough program, you'd have deputies there. That management is going to help you develop a work breakdown structure, which defines everything that you're going to do throughout the entirety of the mission. Organizational breakdown structure is the hierarchy of who's involved and the integrated master plan defines the schedule along how you're accomplishing those systems engineering is incredibly important and we in the alabama keeps that initiative use a model-based systems engineering approach and that'll be described in detail at the next spacecraft seminar series you're going to need to have individual teams responsible for some of those uh, pay, uh, platform subsystems, and you need to identify who the partner institutions are. So with us, we have Auburn, Alabama, UAH, South Alabama, UAB, Tuskegee, Drake State, a lot of people involved, and they need to be identified within the organizational breakdown structure. You have to know if you're contracting out development, a lot of times science missions will contract out their payloads to Arizona State University or to Johnson. Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, who are very good at what they do. Um, and you need to know, do I need to develop or am I going to purchase this? So that's the COTS versus in-house. And that comes down to your analysis of alternatives. You got to know what launch vehicles are available because you can say, I want to fly out to the moon and I want to develop a mission for the moon. But if a launch vehicle is not going to take you there, you're never leaving the ground. So it's important to align the mission that you're trying to develop with those launch vehicle opportunities. And there's a lot of them out there. Uh, and you can use launch service providers, effectively brokers for rocket spaces. Uh, they can help you out a lot. Finally, for university class missions in particular, grants from NASA, the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, DOD, they will oftentimes announce that they'll fund something for a certain purpose. NASA in particular does this quite a bit. Inside those spacecraft, you have several subsystems. Some of them are optional, but they break down to a couple that are always there. You have some form of structural integrity. You are controlling the thermal aspects of the spacecraft. You are controlling what the spacecraft does. That's the, the command and data handling. You are communicating with Earth. That's TTNC, controlling the attitude and determining where you are and how fast you're moving. That's GNNC providing power to these subsystems, EPS, and also generating power if need. Uh, depending on what your payload is, you'll have that. And you might have certain mechanisms. Uh, NIA Scout has this uh, adjustable uh, mass translator that uh, determines where the center of inertia is, uh, center of gravity. Uh, you can have propulsion if you need to change your orbit. And then you can have ECLIS, which is environmental control and life system support, life support system. So if there's anything growing, it doesn't have to be a human, a plant could be in there. Uh, flight software obviously has to be included unless it's a bare metal system, which does happen. And finally, you have to analyze your orbital mechanics and astrodynamics, which involves a team of its own. So for that commercial support, there's lots of companies. And generally, it's div you divide these satellites into a payload and a bus, and companies sell those buses. You they're they're available for purchase uh Enduras, endurasat pumpkin gom space clyde space blue canyon a bunch of these companies exist and they all have benefits uh specific to them but they all they all have the same cubesat form factor and it makes things much cheaper and it makes things a little bit plug and play okay so now we're going to jump into some of the uh, orbital mechanics and astrodynamics aspect. Um, I don't expect anybody to have a, a background in this in, in, unless you've taken some of those classes, but feel free to jump in with questions at, at any time. Um, we'll, we're happy to answer. So we are going to talk about a couple of parts of this. It's too detailed to get into the full thing, but we're going to talk about coordinate frames what defines motion in space and then we're going to talk about some three-dimensional orbits and what those look like and credit goes to dr david Cisai for all of the figures that you're showing that are going to be shown here okay so we'll start with some coordinate frames this is heliocentric ecliptic this the sun is at the middle of this the x-axis points towards the first point of aries which is actually now in the constellation pisces so if you know anyone who does astrology stuff please tell them that they're wrong um the x plane is that earth orbit so anywhere the earth goes around uh and that z axis is parallel to the sun's north pole so the sun does also have a pole 
Um, this is geocentric equatorial. This is the one that we use predominantly in our program. Uh, Earth-centered inertial, so the, the vernal equinox is just, just a direction space, points towards the star. Um, the X plane is the equator, and the Earth North Pole is the uh, the Z axis, and that's going to be true north. Um, so, this is what's really important about this is that while the Earth spins, the coordinate frame does not. That's the the inertial part of this. Um, so, ECI, you're going to see this. Uh, then the next one is Earth centered, Earth fixed, which is really just ECI, except it rotates with the earth. Uh, so if it rotates with the earth, you have to know what time it is. And keeping time in space is a little bit different than keeping time on earth. A lot of times you'll see sidereal time. Um, sidereal time you'll, you'll see is more about the rotation than it is what time we perceive to be on earth. Um, so this follows, I don't expect anybody to know what any of the, um, the, the parameters nomenclature are. Okay, so let's talk about Johann Kepler and Isaac Newton. Um, Newton, of course, had had some laws postulated of, of motion, uh, and Johann Kepler described how these orbital bodies moved, but not why. Uh, why wasn't, it wasn't what he was good at. Um, so Isaac Newton then described gravity in Principia, which kind of brought everything together. The first one that matters here, that just to get a sense of how things move, is that every orbit is an ellipse. It, it is elliptical, and it might be really short and fat, or it might be uh, short and fat the other way, um, long and thin, but it, it could also be a perfect circle. Or uh, if it is outside of an orbit, it might be a parabola or a hyperbola. Um, but it, they all kind of move the same. There are ways you can calculate all these. We're not going to be doing any of this math today, but I wanted to put this up there in case anybody was interested. Um, you have a, a semi-major uh, axis, which is A, and a lot of the equations deal specifically with that semi-major axis, and you're going to see that the, the period is, is uh, slightly proportional to that. Um, so this is how you calculate a little bit of those uh, values. And some of the, the two big ones that I want you all to understand are eccentricity and inclination. Eccentricity is how elliptical it is. If that E is equal to zero, it is a perfect circle. So Earth's eccentricity, I think, is like 0.01. It is not very elliptical. It, it's, it's fairly circular. But your orbital period and the inclination, which is as you're along that plane, it kind of shifts. Um, so if, if it's not equatorial, it's going to be slightly diagonal with respect to the Earth. That's the inclination. The orbital period, how long it takes to orbit, and that inclination, they don't need to change necessarily with that eccentricity. So in the second law, the it, it, an orbit sweeps out equal area and equal time. And this has a lot to do with the velocity of the satellite. So if that satellite is far away, it's going to move more slowly because it's sweeping out equal area in equal time. So the time it takes to sweep out B is going to be the time it takes to sweep out C is going to be the time it takes to sweep out A if those areas are equal. So it's going to move really fast along A at your perihelion, your perigee, and get really, really slow and reach your slowest point at the apogee, the aphelion, if it's orbiting the, the sun. Finally, uh, the third law, square of the period, is proportional to the cube of the mean distance. And that's that A that we were talking about there. So if you know the mean distance that the body is from uh, the, the, the center, uh, whatever it's orbiting around, you're going to know how long it takes it to orbit. So here you can see in three dimensions, if you put Newton's math of the why and Kepler's math of the, of the how together, you can develop some orbital uh, elements. There's um, six primary ones that we can use. Uh, inclination, eccentricity are, are, are two really good ones. And here on the left, you can see um, uh, an, an orbit from uh, AGI's STK, Systems Toolkit. Okay, so 
a little bit about how these are described. If that inclination zero to 90, it's direct. If it is 90 to 180, then that's retrograde. You probably heard like Merc Mercury's in retrograde. Uh, um, it, it really just means it's going the opposite direction with respect to Earth. Um, if it is 90, it's polar, equatorial, zero. Um, but it's, it can also be equatorial the other way. So equatorial retrograde. If the period of a satellite body is equal to the rotation rate of Earth, so you can see the exact time there, it's geosynchronous. That's the way they call it. And if that inclination is zero, so it's equatorial, uh, geosynchronous, they call that geostationary. So a geosynchronous is going to look at kind of a vertical, uh, or a geosynchronous non-geostationary is going to see this vertical strip on Earth, and the geostationary is going to point at one, if it's a communications or Earth observation, it's going to point at one location on Earth. Uh, low Earth orbit is about to, some people say up to 2000 or 2200, doesn't super matter, but it's, it's low, it's up to 1500, and you can have very low Earth orbit, things like that. Medium goes up to about 35800, and that 35800 has to do with the distance of geosynchronous. Um, and then you can have highly elliptical, which either which starts really close and then goes really far away. Um, so that's that's fun. Uh, this is a bit about that sidereal time. So as as Earth moves with respect to the sun, it doesn't it, it doesn't look the same direction to the sun. It is it, it slightly changes. So the sidereal day is not the same as a, a mean day on Earth. So they call this a mean solar day. Uh, and this is, a, if you have a sun synchronous orbit, you are in sync with the mean solar day. So your relationship with the sun is never going to change. And that's why we call that a sun synchronous orbit. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, in the sunlight at all times. If it is, it's following the Terminator or it's just got a really high altitude, but it, it is, um, it's not going to change with respect to the sun because of the way uh, the satellite is processing around Earth. Okay, so anything about the orbital mechanics, the coordinate frames, the ECI, the, and the laws are, are the big deals there equal areas and equal times, saying that it's going to get slower as it gets far away and faster as it gets closer. And if you know how far away it is, you can calculate the orbit duration. OK, so moving into the structural integrity, mostly it's going to be metals in space. That's they, they work really well. They're strong. They're well suited. The, the thing that you have to worry about a lot with structural materials in space is that in a vacuum uh, on Earth, air gets into the structure, just molecules get in. And then when you send it to space, those molecules get sucked out into space. And they call it that outgassing. Uh, it can be evaluated. The ASTM standard E595 handles that. NASA's also got some standard materials, but that's one of the big things that you're looking at aside from, is it gonna break in the launch vehicle? Uh, there are some NASA standards, 6016, and um, I should say MSFC, Marshall uh, Space Flight Center standard 3029. Those can help you select your materials, but it has to be able to resist the stress, static, dynamic, and thermal. Uh, it has to not expand too much when it gets into uh, a hot and cold environment. You don't want it uh, expanding and contracting too much. That outgassing we were talking about is, is a primary concern because when it outgasses, that gas can get on things like sensors so that's going to distort your your sensor output values you don't want to buy you're not going to minecraft it and build a spacecraft at a diamond you gotta you gotta have some cost uh considerations in there unless you're just uh balling but there's also things like yeah you could build a spacecraft out of titanium, which is very costly, but you probably can't machine it easily. So you have to buy something that you can machine. It has to be readily available in case something breaks and you need more. And of course it has to not fail. It has to resist the stresses and it has to not fatigue over time. There's three kinds of stresses. There's static, dynamic, and thermal, and the duration of those changes over time. Static stresses are predominantly going to be your launch vehicle stresses. That is when they launch into space, 
uh, it is going to shake it really hard. That's a dynamic stress, but you've also got a push, a thrust from the launch vehicle. That's a static stress. Dynamic can be uh, acoustic. It can be vibrational. It can happen from a mechanism popping. Um, but it, it's a vibration that is incurred on the spacecraft. Um, and that you're going to figure out how many times it's vibrating and then multiply that by the duration. And that's how, how you know how many cycles you're going to get. Thermal is closely associated with your eclipse. If it's not an eclipse, if it just stays in sunlight, it's just going to be hot the whole time, which is not so bad for thermal cycling, but pretty bad for some of your electronic components. But in general, it's going to get hot when it's in the sun, and it's going to get cold when it's in eclipse. And for LEO spacecraft, there's about 16 orbits per day, give or take, based on the altitude. Because um, remember, you know the distance, you know the period, and the orbital period once around Earth. So if there's about 16, if you have eclipses present in half, you're going to have 16 in the sun and 16 in uh, eclipse. So you need to be able to calculate how many times those stresses are going to happen. If you have um, if you have fasteners, uh, which of course many metallic structures do, those fasteners are where are going to bear the brunt of a lot of the heating and cooling. So that expansion and contraction is going to harm your fasteners uh, almost more so than your spacecraft structures, unless they're very thin. Um, satellites uh, have you need to make sure that they're going to not going to vibrate close to resonant frequencies, your fundamental vibrational modes. Um, and on satellites, on CubeSats in particular, because they're so small, you don't generally have to test for acoustics. Uh, it, it's not going to harm them as much because they don't have as much area. So I'm not saying don't just don't just ignore it, but you generally don't have to put these CubeSats in an acoustic chamber unless you've got big, flat, flexible plates. Okay, so here's a couple technical performance measures, and for many of the subsystems, we'll kind of step through these. First, you need to know what your rotational inertia matrix is. Um, this defines how much energy it's going to take to spin something. So this has to do with the ice skater whose arms are out. So they're going to spin more slowly than if they're close in. So if you have solar arrays that are deployed and they're really, really far out, it's going to take more effort to turn those than if they were really close in. And we're going to see that with the parallel axis theorem momentarily. You need to know what your minimum factor of safety is if you're using metallic structures, and NASA standard 5001 defines those. You have to do this for ultimate stresses, yield stresses, and your qualification stresses. These are separate. Uh, ultimate is at the, the top of the stress strain curve. Uh, yield is, is where it stops being, being linear. Um, and qualification is what you tested it to. Um, based on what what kind of environment are you going to be in versus what kind of environment can you withstand? Uh, not You don't always want to shake it till it breaks. For the fatigue life, you need to have it four times the, your mission duration. So that fatigue life has to do a lot with the, stru uh, the stresses, uh, particularly dynamic stresses. Um, so you can calculate how long your satellite is going to survive, and you need to have that more than four times whatever your mission duration is. For the stowed solar is stowed natural frequency, they're very, very thin. So you need to make sure that their vibrational frequency, their fundamental frequencies, are at least an octave apart from the launch vehicle. Uh, natural frequency. And if you do that, your solar rays are not going to have a resonant frequency and they won't break on the way up. So it's important to calculate or, or test for that. Finally, your hinge, if you have deployable solar rays, which for our spacecraft we do, um, when they deploy, that backstop is going to incur a lot of stress and it's going to cause a lot of vibrations. So you just want to make sure that the hinge is not going to break, that the backstop's not going to break. You need to look at that parameter. Uh, Aluminum 6061T6 and 775T73 are uh, used quite a bit. Um, uh, aerospace engineers tend to stray from 5000 series. That's, that's something we don't use very much. The fasteners are commonly stainless steel 316, widely available, reliable, uh, machinable. Not that you really want to machine faster as much. Stainless steel A286 is what you're going to use if you have a lot of money or you have a lot of risk. Uh, they are what are used in jet engines, and they don't break. 
uh, they're hard to get to. Polymer matrix composites like carbon fiber, they outgas a whole lot. So that's why you don't see satellites built out of carbon fiber. Even though it's a very low cost, very strong material, that polymer comes out in gaseous form, the whole thing gets very brittle and it breaks. Uh, metal matrix composites, which you're just, you're not using polymers, you're using metals in the uh, for the matrix, they're pretty expensive. Ceramic matrix composites in space are really reserved for propulsion rocket nozzles. Um, those those are where there's those are used, and not a whole lot of other places. Um, so I want to want to start here, and I'll go ahead and help with this math. But uh, well, on the next math, it'll be on y'all. So this is just an example. Artemis 1, they tried to launch several times. The third time they were going to, they uh, didn't because of Hurricane Ian. Um, but here are some thrust values with it and the mass with and without fuel. So we're going to look at Newton's second law to figure out what that acceleration is going to be. Because when you're doing FEA, finite element analysis, you don't generally calculate a force and then a stress and then apply those stresses. What you're going to do is calculate the acceleration and then apply that acceleration to point masses in the finite element analysis. So, but for a sanity check, you can calculate what that force is gonna to be to see if something is going to, to fail. So F is equal to MA, uh, force measured in Newtons. So if I have 37,365,061 uh, Newtons, I can divide that uh, by the total mass with fuel of that spacecraft, 2608156. Uh, and that is um, acceleration of 14.3 meters per second squared. And that is a fair amount. It's going to accelerate not super slow. In comparison to Saturn V, it weighed, I'm going to use uh, freedom units for this, it weighed 7 million pounds, and it had 7.5 million pounds of thrust. So it just barely crept off the launch pad, but it did. So if you have that 14.3 uh, meters per second squared, and on a 25 kilogram CubeSat, you can calculate what kind of forces would be applied there. That's just an example of some of the, the calculations involved with static stresses, but uh, thermal and dynamic are a little bit more complicated, and we're not going to use those as examples. Uh, it matters when you calculate them because they don't all happen at once. So at launch, you're going to get that static stress, and you're going to get dynamic stresses, both lateral and axial. And the directions that you apply them matter greatly. Uh, when you are in space, uh, in releasing mechanisms like deploying solar arrays, that is going to cause vibrations and you don't have the constraint of the container, the dispenser anymore. So it becomes a little bit dangerous to have those. You need to check, is this deployment of the mechanism going to break the spacecraft? And once everything's deployed, once you're on orbit, really the only thing you're going to incur, unless you get hit by a micrometeoroid, James Webb got hit recently, um, it, it's really just thermal stresses getting hot and getting cold, expand and contract, and there's a thermal cycle stress associated with that. So thermal control. We got a couple thermal folks here. Y'all are going to find this pretty, pretty easy. The big thing that I want to point out here is that the purpose of thermal analysis on spacecraft is not to predict temperatures. We do not just try to go out there and predict temperatures immediately. You do have to eventually predict some temperatures to make sure that they're not going to exceed the not to exceed temperatures associated with a given component. Lithium ion batteries, they can't get above, they don't like to get above 25, 35 degrees C. So you want to make sure that those aren't going to get to 40, 50 degrees C, or else their life is going to decrease dramatically, or they'll expand and break their constraints. But the purpose is not to predict temperatures. The purpose is to ensure that your passive cooling is enough to radiate enough heat, and your active heating is enough to keep it hot or warm during your eclipse, your cold conditions. We're gonna talk about how to determine some heat fluxes. We're gonna talk about uh, how to calculate absorbed heat 
and a couple thermal control strategies. Um, note there, we do have some particle radiation associated with this, but we, we do that as part of the thermal control team because you have to calculate the same inputs for charged particle heating as you do for some of the total ionizing dose and non-ionizing energy loss. Okay, the two main TPMs, technical performance measures for thermal control, are implemented heater wattage and closely related to radiator area, your implemented area emissivity product. This is calculating effectively how much area and emissivity do I need to radiate out heat to keep it at a certain temperature. So we're going to do an isothermal example today uh, and, and get y'all custom to that. For radiation effects, this is thrown into thermal control. We're not going to talk about radiation too much, but if your total ionizing dose for a component is too high, and that is how much rads, you know, shout out to fallout, uh, how many rads you're incurring, um, you can have an air, uh, uh, radiation shield, and you need to know how much that radiation shield is going to weigh, how much mass it's going to have per centimeter squared. Uh, your solar arrays, due to radiation hitting the nucleus of an atom in your solar cells, those are going to incur efficiency loss over time. So for a given mission duration, you can use that non-ionizing energy loss value to calculate how much efficiency am I going to lose over a year, three months, whatever your mission is. Uh, you can calculate what that TID, total ionizing dose, is for each of your sensitive electronic components based on where they are, how much shielding or aluminum is around them. And you can also calculate using NASCAP, which is a, a program out of NASA, what the surface charge is on a spacecraft. So you have protons and electrons are in a lot of the Van Allen belts and in space, they come from the sun too. And uh, protons are 1,831 times more massive than electrons. So if you have a given electric potential, F is equal to MA, but for charged particles, your electrons are going to accelerate faster than your protons. So within a given flux, you're going to have more electrons passing through that than protons. So you're going to gain a negative potential. When you have that negative potential, if you're passing through high radiation places like the high latitude zones or the South Atlantic anomaly, that can increase your uh, spacecraft surface charge to negative 2,000, negative 3,000 volts. And obviously that's a problem if some of your sensitive electronics can't get that high or their grounding can't be associated with that high of a surface potential. Finally, uh, using NUMIT 2D, N-U-M-I-T 2D um, from JPL, you can calculate how much the PCBs, the printed circuit boards, they're going to have some internal charging from those high latitude zones, the South Atlantic anomalies as well, but that's a different, different conversation that we're not going to get into too much. Okay, so let's talk about heat sources in space. First and foremost, you have radiation from the sun. This is electromagnetic radiation, both in this and in the telemetry tracking command section. We're going to talk about electromagnetic radiation here. This is energy coming from the sun. It, we see it day to day. It's outside. Cool. You also have that radiation from Earth, and we're going to see how momentarily. The reflection of the solar radiation from the surface of the Earth is called Earth's albedo, and that has just about the same contribution uh, to heat flux as Earth emission. You have free molecular heating, which is like drag heating. You're running into atoms. Um, oh, he lets people in. Uh, you're running into atoms within Earth's atmosphere, molecules. And so that is heating things up as it impacts it. Um, you also have charged particle heating, which is those electrons and protons. As they hit the spacecraft structure, they slow down and they deposit energy as they're slowing down, which heats the spacecraft up, but not very much. You have operational heating, which is ohmic heating from running the electronics within your spacecraft, and you have intentional heating, which is when it gets cold, you heat it up. You provide power to heaters, which are just resistive elements, high resistivity that gets converted to heat and warms up the spacecraft. So that is all of the sources, and we're gonna talk about uh, four of them today, solar emission, earth emission, earth albedo, and operational heating. 
Okay, so these, the top three, electromagnetic radiation, then you free molecular, physical interactions, charged particle, particles coming in, operational, power conversion efficiencies, intentional, heaters, active heating. Okie doke. So this does get complicated. And I want you to take a look at this big, scary equation up at the top right. So you can see that each of these has been parameters in this equation has been defined. But I want to step through them one by one to make a very simple point. 2 times pi times h, which is Planck's constant, and c naught, which is the speed of light in a vacuum. N is a refractive index. It's just equal to 1 in space. Then you have lambda, which is your wavelength. Uh, e to the h, this is Planck's constant again, speed of light in a vacuum, refractive index, Boltzmann's constant, another constant, your wavelength, and T, which is temperature of whatever this emitting body is. It might be you or me or a star. But the thing that I want y'all to notice about this is that all of these, with the exception of wavelength and temperature, are constants. They're, they're just constants. So what you can do is plug in all the values for those and then integrate that from zero to infinity. So over all possible wavelengths, that zero to infinity is the, the lambda right here. And what you end up with is the Stefan Boltzmann constant right here. So I should, oh, there it is. I put it right there. Didn't have to go further. So if you get that Stefan Boltzmann constant by integrating over the whole spectrum, uh, if you do it, per wavelength, you get something like this. So this is the spectrum, the spectral power emitted from our sun. And that's important because it peaks, I know y'all haven't seen the visible wavelength spectrum yet, but it peaks around 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. This is the visible spectrum as we know it. Our sun emits most strongly in this spectrum. So our eyes evolved to see in this spectrum. If the spectrum was different, if our Earth was uh, farther away, or if the, if the sun's surface was a different temperature, our eyes would have evolved to see a different wavelength. So between about here and here, if you can see my mouse, uh, between about 0.4 and 0.7, this is where the sun emits most strongly. Lower than that, so close to the left side, that's going to be your ultraviolet. And after that is going to be your infrared. So one thing to notice, to note, is if the temperature is lower, if the temperature is not 5,780 Kelvin, uh, let's say it's 300 Kelvin, which is approximately the temperature of the Earth and you and me, it's not going to emit in this visible spectrum. It's going to emit over here over in the infrared. So when you have a camera to see humans at night, it's an infrared camera, right? That's because humans emit infrared light. Ice cubes emit infrared light. It's all a function of the temperature. So let's do an, a, a very simple example with solar emission. So if you integrate from zero to infinity and you get this Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is 5.67 times 10 to the eighth, very easy, 5678, what you get is about 63,300,000. Now that is the amount of heat flux coming off the surface of the sun. It's not at the spacecraft distance, that's at the surface. It's right at the surface of the sun. So what we need to do is to account for the flux dissipation as it moves away from the sun's surface. And what you do is you apply a radiative view factor. This is just one view factor from a patch to a sphere. And you have this, this is the distance, the center of the sphere. And this R, this is the, the radius of that sphere. So if I want to know what the heat flux from the sun is at the distance, at, at Earth's distance, or so the satellite's distance, is about the same you know, compared to the distance to the sun, I'm going to take that 63 million, I'm going to multiply it by this radiative view factor, and then this one minus fs is just a shadow fraction. It is, it just, are we an eclipse or not? So that's what the equation looks like. You get 63 million, and this is one AU, one astronomical unit, this 1.496, uh, 149 million kilometers away. Uh, you get 
and uh, divided by the radius. So remember, it's the distance to the center of the body divided by the radius of the body squared. You get 1366 watts per meter squared. That is the average solar emissive flux. Now, if we're closer to the sun, we get to about 147 million kilometers. That increases to 1414 watts per meter squared. If we're farther away from the sun, we get to about 152 million kilometers. It goes down to about 1322 watts per meter squared. So we're going to deal with this average, but just know that it does fluctuate between 1414 and 1322. Importantly, those numbers don't change uh, within about 1% over long, long periods of time. So when you hear people say that climate change is because of the sun changing how much energy it's putting out, tell them they're stupid. Tell them they're really stupid. That's not how this works at all. Uh, climate change happens because we uh, are pumping CO2 and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. They absorb more as they absorb the energy is what it is. But as you increase the amount of absorbing gases, it's going to absorb more. End of story. So back to spacecraft. So let's do this same math for Earth emission. So first calculator one. I uh, want y'all to get out your calculators and somebody tell me what this answer is and we're going to walk through the equation. So the radiation emitted from the surface of the earth is just the emissivity, and we're going to call this one, times this Stefan Boltzmann constant, 5.67 times 10 to the negative eighth, times the temperature of the earth to the fourth power. That fourth power is just how it shakes out. So Multiply that by the radiative view factor. What's the value? Who's got it? So it's the surface radiation from the Earth. Now, the difference between this equation and the last one is you have your altitude, which is the d orbit here plus the uh, distance to the, uh, the radius of the Earth. Previously, the sun, that value was to the center of the sun. So now we're doing the distance to the surface plus the distance to the center over the radius squared. I got 383.7. 383.7. Thank you very much. So we're going to call that a clean 384. Does anybody have any questions about how we calculated that value? Because we're going to build upon this math. All right. So now we're going to talk about Earth albedo. So it's very, very similar to the Earth, except this is reflection from the sun. So the, the sun is radiating to Earth. It gets reflected off the sun or off of the Earth. And then that reflection comes to the spacecraft. So instead of that Earth surface, you're going to calculate again the, the solar heat flux at the Earth's distance, which is that 1366. And then that 1366, you're going to divide that by that same radiative view factor from Earth emission. You're gonna multiply that value by a reflective coefficient. So we call this the albedo factor. And I want you to use 0 0.33 here. It's about an average, but it, it really does depend. If you're talking about just white ice, very clean snow, that albedo is 0.9. If the Earth was completely covered in clouds, it would be about 0.55. Uh, if it, the Earth is completely covered in dense ve vegetation, it would be about 0.18. But here we're going to use 0.33, and then you multiply it by a solar zenith angle. So here's those vectors to the Earth, to the spacecraft, and to the uh, from the spacecraft to the Earth and the spacecraft to the Sun. Here is this zeta, the solar zenith angle. So this is the value. It's just given here. We're going to call it 35 degrees. So 1366 plus 600 plus 6378 over 6378, whole thing squared, times 0.33, times cosine of 
You got 308.48. 308.48. And you are correct, sir. Very nice. All right. So any uh, question about Earth Albedo, we can ask him here too. This is that relative contribution from each of the sources. And take a look at the altitude. This is uh, a highly elliptical orbit. So it gets really far away and then it gets really close and then it gets really far away and then it gets really close. But when it's really close, you can see here that the direct solar, because we're always in the sun, it stays the same and it's always the highest. Earth emission and Earth albedo they are approximately the same, but Earth, uh, it, it really depends on how close you are and what the angles are, but they, they're, they get very close and they, they kind of trade places. Free molecular heating, that drag heating doesn't do very much and charged particle heating doesn't do very much either. It really depends on uh, what kind of environment you're going through. Um, whether that's a, a heavy atmospheric environment or a high latitude zone or South Atlantic anomaly. So, Let's look at a thermal energy balance. So we've got the values that we've calculated so far, 1366, 308, and 384. Heat in minus heat out plus heat generated is equal to heat stored, which for an isothermal system is zero. So you're calculating your heat in. We're going to assume the direction of albedo and Earth are equal, and we're going to assume that the absorptivity for all of this is just one. To make things easier, we're not going to worry about the absorptivity there. So you take the heat flux from solar multiplied by the projected area, and you're going to do the same thing for Earth to the Earth projected area and the albedo uh, to the Earth projected area, and you get the heat in. The heat out is going to be the total area of the spacecraft, uh, which we're, we're going to calculate, times the emissive, emissivity of the spacecraft, which we're going to calculate, times the Stefan Boltzmann constant, and that temperature to the fourth. So the full equation is down here, and we're calculating the product of the spacecraft area times the emissivity of the spacecraft. So what is that A times epsilon value? I believe in every one of you. Thirteen sixty six times point five plus three eighty four times point two plus three oh eight times point two plus Q gen which is going to be 20 watts. That's the amount of heat generated from operating the spacecraft. Most of that comes from the EPS, the electrical power system, the conversion efficiencies of the maximum power point trackers and the DC to DC converters. And divide that by the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is 5.67 times 10 to the negative eighth, times that temperature of the spacecraft, which is here, 315 Kelvin, a pretty hot temperature for a spacecraft. What do we got? 1.5. About 1.5, exactly. So the total area of the spacecraft times the emissivity of each face is about 1.5 meters squared. So if that is more area than the spacecraft has, that means that you probably need some kind of deployable radiator. Uh, if, if that this helps you make those kinds of decisions as a first order analysis. So if you need to reject a lot of heat or control your heat, maybe some parts can get hotter than others, which is a way you can get around that radiator problem. You there's some components that you can employ. Heat pipes are some that don't aren't often used on small sats, but they they can be if you have uh, cryogenic payloads, things like that. 
where you make one side really hot and one side is not so hot. So evaporator and condenser. And you can get uh, copper has a thermal conductivity of, I think, about 300, 400 watts meter squared, depending on it. These things can get about 10,000 watts per meter. Uh, no, not watts per squared, watts per meter Kelvin. Um, they can get about 10,000 watt per meter Kelvin, so they can do a whole lot. Radiators, if you pump heat into the radiators, they get hot. T to the fourth is that uh, emissive power, so they can radiate a lot of heat very quickly. Um, you can put on surface coatings to tailor the optical properties. Uh, paints are really good. Tapes are very easy to apply. They're a little bit more expensive than paints, but paints are kind of difficult to apply and they they degrade. I mean, the tapes do too, but uh, thermal straps connect certain uh, thermal components. So if you have a really hot component and you want to connect it to the radiator, you can put a thermal strap between them, not even a heat pipe, just a conduction like copper. And then you have some kind of specialty stuff. So advanced cooling technologies, ACT, they have these wedge locks. So normally the wedge locks in a, a PCB constraint only has two thermal paths, but these were designed to have four. So they can go all those different ways. And these are just little things you can do to tailor the thermal control of your spacecraft. Here's an example of something in thermal desktop. Uh, pretty colors means absolutely nothing without knowing boundary conditions. Um, but this is an example of what a, a nodal analysis might look like. And then here are some uh, MATLAB versions. Uh, in general, if you're doing MATLAB, you're doing isothermal analyses. So it's not a great idea to do a trend. So we are predicting what the actual temperature is. It's better to know what your hottest and coldest environments are, calculate those and provide it onto a higher fidelity simulation done in Simulink or thermal desktop. And that's what we do. So any questions on thermal? Anything at all? Stop me if you think of anything. All right, so command and data handling, brains of the satellite. This controls what information uh, is, is sent to which directions, uh, controls whether, whether things are turned on and off. The EPS provides the power, but the CNDH system controls when that power is provided to things. Um, and it, it generally is a stack of printed circuit boards or electrical components in their own housing that you purchase from some vendor. Uh, the onboard computer is the main part. Uh, there's other ways to describe it. You'll often hear single board computer computer, SBC. And sometimes onboard computers don't have enough connections. They don't have enough ports on them, like a USB port. You don't use USB in space, but um, they don't have enough of those. So you build more boards to give you more peripheral connectivity. And if you have multiple payloads, you might need multiple payload connections. So you can call those payload interface boards or payload interface unit. Doesn't super matter. So how to build a computer? You're going to need a processor, some that 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 CPU, central processing unit, and you're going to need memory. And that memory for a spacecraft is often broken down primarily into working, boot, and configuration memory. Sometimes you can add telemetry. I added it here, but so, sometimes people just work it in with working memory. Generally, your working memory is RAM, uh, random access memory. It's going to be volatile, so every time the spacecraft turns off, it'll reset. Your boot memory is golden. You never want it to change. It stays what it is. The operating system's on it. We'll talk about that in a second. It's non-volatile. It doesn't go away when you turn it off. Configuration memory, those are your parameters that get loaded into your working memory when you start it up. So that wants to be non-volatile as well. You need a watchdog timer, and it needs to be connected to a real-time clock that is not connected to the main clock of the processor. So in space, you get radiation damage that can stop the working of your processor, of your CPU, of multiple CPUs. Um, and your watchdog timer constantly, they call it nibbling, which I hate, but it is just constantly nibbling away at the processor. And whenever it doesn't receive a response from it, then it shuts the power off. It just shuts it down to make sure that no damage propagates throughout the system. Memory management is for bit corrections primarily. In space, you have, it's space is highly radioactive. It's not our friend. Um, zeros become ones, ones become zeros. So you can change that, you can fix it, 
on orbit. And that's what the memory management unit does. Uh, and you can use error correction codes. There's hamming, extended hamming, read Solomon, those kind of things. Finally, you have your peripheral connectivity. What are all the things that you need to connect to? What, how many data pins that you need to talk to those things? So that needs to be defined within the CNDH system. I have some um, curiosity. Yeah. Is the diagram on the previous slide based off of the old SOC? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, this this is something uh, a CNDH team put together uh, several several semesters ago. Um, we were we were looking at a uh, Xilinx FPGA, and you'll see another figure about that Xilinx FPGA in a moment. Okay. Good question. Here are some technical performance measures. So. This first one can be expressed as a ratio or as a difference, um, but you have a processor throughput that is measured in DMIPS per megahertz, dry stone million instructions per second per megahertz. So that per second per megahertz, a little bit weird. Dry stone is a benchmark test. It is a kind of a play on words because there was an older uh, benchmark test for processor throughput called whetstone. So whetstone, dry stone. Uh, so the million instructions per second, you calculate how many instructions your most rigorous operation takes and the time that you have to execute it in. So that's the million instructions per second. And this is a benchmark test. So it's saying what those instructions are gonna be. So you have some amount of processor throughput, DMIPS, and you divide that by the processor clock speed in megahertz. So you want that to be somewhere around 100 megahertz. You don't want to operate things in space or at around a gigahertz or higher because of single event transients, which is a complicated thing. Just you don't, you don't want to push it to the limit. Keep it at around 100 megahertz unless you have some really fancy hardware. Uh, so you need to have some uh, enough to compensate for what you're going to have to do. Some uh, space processors have a value of 5 DMITs per megahertz, some 2.3. So those are the values that you're going to see. And I expect our, for our spacecraft, DMITs per megahertz requirement to be somewhere around 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And it's very likely going to happen for GNNC uh, processes. So going, uh, you see four margins here, boot configuration, telemetry, and working. This is just a difference between how much you have and how much you need. Um, it's, it's, you just figure out how much that you need for it. So boot memory, no, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, about what's on them, but you just got to make sure that you have enough. Finally, number of header pins is important. If you need 200 header pins because you have a bunch of 15 pin micro D connections and you only have say 168 or something on your header, then you need another header. Uh, so that's, you don't have to calculate the number of pins as a TPM for every subsystem, but for CNDH, it is fairly important. So here's that figure I was mentioning. This is just an example of one system on chip architecture. It is the entire memory processor, GPU if you need it, and for an FPGA, any programmable logic on a single chip. These are expensive, but they're very space and volume efficient. So they make good candidates for use in space, and the FPGA part of it, field programmable uh, gate array, that is, uh, it's kind of like Legos, but with transistors. You can turn them into whatever you want. So if you can create some kind of chip on orbit, that's a really desirable feature. Uh, fin vets have become popular. They have transistors in both vertical and horizontal directions. So you can get a little bit more bang for your buck in terms of uh, volume efficiency. And finally, these things often are associated with latch circumvention circuitry. And that latch refers to single event latch up, which is another radiation effect. Radiation comes in, it causes a latch up of, uh, I'm going to call it a semiconductor here um, to, to abstract away, but effectively your processor stops working. So when it stops working, you have to circumvent the problem and then reset the, the computer. And then it works again. Um, but this is an example of all of the things that might be on a single system on chip architecture and many spacecraft fly with system on chip architectures. So here's that memory. Let's talk about what's on it. The boot memory is going to have your uh, boot loader, 
um, which there's a couple, build root, bootlin, DOS, U-boot, those are all examples of it. Uh, an operating system, which we'll talk about more in the flight software section. Uh, this needs to be golden. If you cannot tolerate changes to zeros and ones in this. So there are certain types of memory that are read only. You can't update them, but they work really well against radiation. So that's the kind of memory that you're going to use for this. Configuration memory is where you load up a lot of the parameters that operate the spacecraft, the things that you want to, to load into your working memory when you initialize the system. So this is going to be non-volatile and everything that you really need to operate, but you don't want to change or calculate while you're uh, initialized, that's going to go here. It needs to be read and write. You do have to be able to update this and we'll show an example of what updating looks like in a moment, but it does need to be more radiation tolerant than say your working memory. So I mentioned before, not everybody has dedicated telemetry memory, but we'll we're including as a separate thing here. It is assumed here that if you want this, it's non-volatile. This is where you're storing all the information that you plan to downlink. So if you are taking science data over time, you might wanna store that in a set of telemetry memory or a dedicated science memory, those kinds of things. Otherwise, you're just going to keep it in working memory and then downlink. But oftentimes people like to do a hard reset to power off and power on before communicating because it makes all the, the zeros and ones in the working memory be what you think they are. So if you want to do that, then you need a non-volatile memory just for what you're going to downlink, which is that telemetry. Okie doke. So this is an example of an avionics box. This was for um, a spacecraft that was being uh, developed at the Alabama Space Grant Consortium, ABEX. Um, shout out, shout out ABEX. Uh, so this includes uh, the payload interface unit, the onboard computer, electrical power system, and software-defined radio. You can see some peripheral connectivity here. These are 15-pin micro Ds, um, some DC to DC conversion hardware, uh, battery management system, and this is the, the maximum PowerPoint tracker um, board. So all of this is the EPS. Then you've got your onboard computer, um, auxiliary interface board, um, payload interface unit and then down here's the software defined radios an old version because these sma cables need to be far apart but not included in here is all of the gnnc hardware anything that's involved in your payload mechanisms hold and release mechanisms deployment switches and of course solar arrays so this is just an example of what it looks like it is a single unit it is a stack of pcbs you have those ice locks from act for thermal management so a lot of thought and time goes into these avionics boxes any questions about CNDH? Hit me if you got them. All right. So telemetry tracking command is all about talking to the ground and from the ground to talk to the spacecraft. Downlink is spacecraft to ground. Uplink, ground to spacecraft. So you're going to have a couple of things in every TTNC system. You're going to have a radio that's gonna amplify the signal. It's gonna filter the signal and mix it up from an intermediate frequency to a carrier frequency, because it doesn't always start at the frequency that gets downlinked to the ground. You need to convert signals that you're sending to the ground from digital signals in the CNDH system to analog signals in the radio. And when you're receiving information, you need to convert signals that you're receiving in analog into digital information. And both of those need to have a very high signal to noise ratio in order for the message to be intelligible. When they're operating uh, singularly, transmit or receive, that's called half duplex. And when they're operating together, that's called full duplex operations. You're going to have an antenna, and that's really just to boost the signal power. Um, there's various types of that, which we'll see in a second. You're going to have an encoding scheme, and that encoding scheme is designed to decrease the bit-specific error uh, ratio. Um, that uh, is going to increase the chances that the ground is going to understand the message that you sent to them. Finally, it's probably going to be deemed very soon that every spacecraft is going to have to have some version of cybersecurity. Elliptical curve integration is the top of the line integration for encrypting uh, spacecraft messages right now. Uh, it's a little bit complicated. We're not going to go into it, but just know that you do need to do some kind of encryption on your spacecraft so that bad actors don't take it over. <laughs> 
a couple TPMs for this. You need to know how much power is delivered to the antenna because the antenna has an efficiency itself. Patch antenna efficiency, a common size, it would be about 55%, something like that. It does, it does depend on the size and type. You need to know what that antenna gain is. So you might get from a certain antenna, 12 decibels dB of gain. Uh, receiver might be something along those lines, but it's that, that dB adding, which is a, a way to, to do calculations on power. You need to understand that for both transmit and receive if you're going to understand what your link margin is, which I didn't include it on TTNC because it's a key performance parameter. But the big, big one that all of these kind of factor into is your link budget margin. Can the ground hear you and can you hear the ground? That is your uplink and downlink link margin. So it's, it's all about calculating that. We're not going to go into that math today, but it is fun. You have a bit error rate, which is the number of bits that are wrong. Uh, you, that is the, if I send a million bits and four of them are wrong, you can calculate your bit error rate there. Um, finally, a signal to noise ratio, S and R. Um, signal power, noise power. Uh, this can be made bit specific and they call that EBNO, uh, EB over NO. Um, not, not everybody calls it EBNO, but I, I have heard many people call it that. But it's a bit specific signal to noise ratio. And turns out you can vary it with things, which is what we're going to see. So here is a good electromagnetic spectrum thing uh, or, or figure. Um, I don't know why the people are naked, but this is this is approximately how big the radiation is compared to given structures. So gamma rays, highly, highly energetic, radio not energetic at all and Planck's constant associates how much energy can fit in a given electromagnetic wave. Uh, you can see the frequency here. So uh, X band, which is something that we commonly um, communicate downlink in is about eight, 8.4, I think it's 7.2 to 11 gigahertz um, is, is X band. And we are currently downlinking an 8.475. Um, yeah, that might be megahertz. Um, I think it's gigahertz, 8.475. Uh, S-band 2.1 is, is what we're currently downlinking in, or, or uplinking in, excuse me. But can anyone tell me if, if S-band is about 2 to 5 gigahertz, then why would we not want to downlink in S-band? If we're worried about noise, if we're worried about signal corruption, why would we not want downlink in two to five gigahertz? In interfere that you're you're on it, but what else is in two to five gigahertz? On the ground, Wi-Fi. That's exactly right. Uh, so if you're downlinking in two to five gigahertz, you're gonna get a lot of noise if you're close to those Wi-Fi signals. So generally you can uplink in S-band around that range, but you wanna downlink in a range that's not used so much. The Federal Communications Commission, they, they're the ones that, that organize this and you have to apply for a license. Uh, the two things that I wanna point out here are this is where you can see at what temperature you're gonna emit these values. So remember the sun is 5780. And that's where you're about to emit the visible spectrum. And if you're colder, about 300, you're really gonna only emit in the infrared. That's a really big deal. And the approximate size, so human skin, human cells are about in this range. So when you're receiving infrared light, your cells are interacting with that wavelength because it's approximately the same size as that wavelength. So that's why you feel infrared light as heat. You are not absorbing heat as the sun's visible light. You're just seeing that light. Your rods and cones are attuned to those wavelengths, but your cells, they're attuned, they're about the same dimension as the infrared. So it absorbs much more strongly. And that's how you feel the heat from that. Um, Skin cancer. 
your if you have uh, thymine, um, your nucleotide in your DNA. Um, I think that's the right word. Nucleotide. Anyway, if you have two thymines next to each other and you get an ultraviolet because it's a much, much smaller entity that ultra, your thymines are going to absorb that ultraviolet ray and they'll fuse together and that's how skin cancer happens. So it's all about how long the wavelength is and it's how big the physical structure is and that determines really whether things are going to be absorbed versus uh, refracted or, or, or reflected. So when we say that we're pumping more CO2 in the atmosphere and that it's going to absorb more radiation, it's because it's the right size to absorb that radiation. It's, it's, a, it's a critical point that people do not understand. Okay. Uh, so radios all pretty much do the same thing. If you're doing transmit function, you're going to take the data, the bits that have been uh, encoded and possibly modulated in bit structure that doesn't have to happen in analog. Uh, so you're going to convert that from a digital 0101 to an analog, which is a waveform, and you're, you're going to convert that there. And then you're going to condition that. You are going to filter it. You're going to amplify the signal. So you're boosting the strength, and you're also boosting the signal to noise ratio. You're saying, this is what I want you to hear. When you when it comes out of the digital to analog converter, it might be about 300 to 500 megahertz. I mean, it really depends on the technology that you're using. But that's your intermediate frequency. So remember I said that we're downlinking in 8.475 gigahertz. So we need to get from 500 megahertz to 8.475 gigahertz. And that is the mixing part of it. You mix in other signals to get a carrier frequency of 8.475. So you're just mixing in other waveforms, like you're putting signs on top of other signs with higher, um, you know, X, 2X, 3X, that kind of thing. Uh, so you get it up to your carrier frequency, and if your carrier frequency is at the right signal to noise ratio with enough power, it will reach the ground, and that's part of the link budget calculation. And we have those link budgets. Happy to provide that if you're interested in the math. For the receiver, it's the same thing but opposite. It's going to receive a very low power signal, and that antenna is going to have some gain, so it'll bump up the signal. You are going to amplify that signal as it's coming in. You're going to filter it, and then it's going to down mix. So you're you're mixing it, but you're just taking out the frequency, uh, the carrier frequency, and getting an intermediate frequency with the same data still. And then that is going to go through an analog to digital digital converter because an analog to digital converter can't convert 2.1 gigahertz unless it's extremely expensive uh so it's the same thing as transmission but in reverse and that's how to build a radio congratulations uh so let's think of the scope of where this physical structure is Within the OSI model, Open Systems Interconnection, there's seven layers, and we're really only talking about the physical layer here. All the other layers from the application to packeting each of these uh, bit structures, segment them, there's lots of different stuff. We'll talk about the coding in a second, uh, but this is just the physical waveform. The rest of it is flight software and to an extent CNDH's job. This is an example of one um, in, in my encoding structure. Uh, this from, comes from CCSDS, Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems. They're the ones who define what we should be doing. And if you are CCSDS compliant, then your stuff is pretty often going to work. This is an example of what's called a concatenated encoding scheme, which means it has a block code and a convolutional code. So the block code is this Reed Solomon. Don't expect anybody to know what this means, but it changes one organization of zeros and ones to other zeros and ones. And it gives you, when you decode it, it's less likely to have incurred an error. Interleaving is like crisscrossing the bits. If you've interleaved them uh, the bits that correspond to a single word are no longer right next to each other. So if you get a single bit error, then you might only have one word error. So interleaving helps you resist those bit error, uh, those bit errors due to radiation or just noise. Um, you could put in a frame sync. So this just tells you, I need to be looking at this section. Then you do a convolutional, like convolutional neural networks that a lot of AI uses. And then you have a modulator, which is like quadrature phase shift keying, or, or that's QPSK. You can do 
8 PSK or, or B PSK, but it's just, just a way to modulate it. And then you do it the same thing backwards and you get your decoded data. So this is what it means to encode it. You're changing the bit scheme to represent something else. Why do we do this? Well, here's that EBNO that we're talking about. So you have your signal to noise ratio. And if you divide it by the number of bits that you're transmitting, that's your, your bit specific signal to noise ratio. So if you apply these concatenated codes, you can see a variety of different ones here. Um, then your bit error rate as your bit specific uh, signal to noise ratio increases your bit error rate just plummets. I mean, for a very, very small increase in signal to noise ratio, which you often get with your amplification filtering, you're going to get very, very low bit error rates. So this 10 negative six, this is one error in a million bits. And if you're downlinking 50 megabytes, uh, so um, 50 million times eight, uh, and my bit error ratio is um, 10 to the minus six, then 400 of my bits might be wrong out of 50 megabytes, which is not so bad. Not so bad at all. Okay, any questions on this? This one's a little bit complicated. All right, pressing on. So for antennas, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You have your parabolic antennas. You see these a lot on the ground. Um, you have patch antennas. This is commonly what, what CubeSats use because they're very small. They don't take up a, a lot of space. You can kind of see one right here. But this is a really fancy one. It's called a reflect array. And this Asara had a solar array on one side and an antenna on the other. And you feed it right here. So you're blasting your signal here. And just from the, the physical structure of this, it's going to reflect it a different direction. And you point this at Earth or Mars or whatever you want to do. Um, so this, this is a very fancy way, but it, it turns out to have a lot of gain. And that is overall TTNC. You're going to organize your bit structure, encode it, modulate it, send it through the radio, and you do it all backwards on the receive side. Questions? All right, moving on. This one's got a little bit of math in it. Get your calculators out. Okay, so we need to control which direction the spacecraft is pointing. Whether we want to point the solar rays at the sun or point our antennas at the ground control station, we need to be able to control that attitude and we need to be able to determine it too. We have to know where are we pointing. So you call that the attitude. And that attitude is disturbed by four sources. You have solar radiation pressure, which is just the sun's uh, photons, uh, that electromagnetic flux that we talked about in the thermal section and the, the TTNC section. So when that hits the spacecraft, those photons don't have mass, but they do have momentum. So if they're hitting them not equally, it can cause the spacecraft to turn. When I say not equally, I mean one side more than the other. Uh, aerodynamic drag, if you have... Uh, one side that is exposed to more drag than others, that'll uh, turn you a little bit. Gravity gradients, that has to do with the Earth isn't a perfect sphere. It looks more like a Skittle. Um, not, not that drastic, but it's not, it's not perfectly spherical. So you, your gravity is going to turn it a little bit. And you have residual magnetic di dipoles, which has to do with how your spacecraft interacts with the magnetosphere. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So if you're below 400 kilometers, you really have to care about your aerodynamic drag because that's where the atmosphere is, right? Uh, a little bit above that, you're looking at the gravitational gradient and the residual magnetic dipoles. Those are your big ones. Above about 500 kilometers, your solar radiation pressure is going to equal aerodynamic drag. And above 500 kilometers, SRP is going to be a much bigger deal than aerodynamic drag. Here's some of those TPMs for GNNC. So first, you need to know if I need to turn my spacecraft a certain amount and a certain number of times, how much capability do I need? And we'll talk about the components that are used in this, but a lot of times it's reaction wheels. And those reaction wheels, you turn your space, you turn it one way and your spacecraft is going to turn the other way. 
So Newton's second law, but rotationally. You need to know the precision at which you can control that rate of the attitude change. So that's degrees per second per axis. That's important. You need to know your pointing authority. So this is if I want to point at the sun, can I point directly at it or am I just kind of going to get a little bit off of it? Same for your ground control station. If you need to point very, very specifically at a very particular point on Earth, say to take a picture of it, you need to have a lot of attitude pointing authority. You need to be able to sense where you're, what you're looking at. That's going to also be in degrees. How closely do you know what you're looking at? And then the last two have to do with navigation. So you get from GPS where you are, what time it is, and you can calculate how fast you're moving from that. So in between GPS signals, you're going to propagate that internally. You're going to tell yourself, I think it's this time, and I think I'm right here. So how much error do you have in that? And that is per kilometers per second in the position drift rate uh, per axis, and it's kilometer per second squared per axis uh, for the velocity. So there are three main ways that you can consider rotation. There is directional cosine matrices. So if you've ever seen a transformation matrix with a lot of sines and cosines, it was probably one of these. Euler angles are often used with aircraft. Um, they, they describe rotation rates and how those can be integrated over time. And then there's a fancy one called a quaternion. And it's all representing the same thing. It's all representing rotation. But quaternions turn out to be the least computationally intense version of this calculation, which is why all the spacecraft components use those. There's ways to turn DC, the directional cosine matrices and Euler angles into quaternions. It's all the same thing. But this is what a quaternion looks like. I don't expect everybody to just get this immediately. And unless you're working with these components, you don't super have to know, but you do need to know that it's the same thing and it just rep as the directional cosine matrix. And it it's very easy to calculate. The directional cosine matrix has a lot of comp uh, computations involved. This is the magnetosphere. So Earth has a, uh, a core, a molten core, and then it has a mantle rotating inside of it. And the core, which is a lot of nickel, rotating in a different direction and speed as the rest of it, creates a dynamo. It, there's a lot of charged particles in that molten structure. And when they rotate like that, you get a electric field and a magnetic field. And if you know how, if you had electromagnetism at all, you know that a changing electric field will induce a magnetic field and a changing magnetic field will induce an electric field. So this is the induction of a magnetic field from the change in electric currents. And it creates a ball of radiation uh, of, of uh, magnetic force around Earth. And that uh, magnetism resists radiation from the sun. It, it creates this kind of shield around us. And that shield, uh, the radiation from the sun goes along these lines and comes in from the front side, and it comes actually all the way around and back in from the back side, and that is what causes the aurora. It's the radiation interacting with this magnetic field, and they get charged, and they become very pretty in the atmosphere. So we can use this magnetic field to control our attitude. And we can measure that magnetic field and we create a model of it. Uh, the in, um, IGRF, the International Geomagnetic Reference Frame Field, I don't remember. Uh, and then the World Magnetic Model, those are programmed in. And if you calculate what you're measuring and then relate that to the IGRF or WMM, you can tell where, you're, where you are. Um, or at least approximately. Everybody actually has the world magnetic model on their phone because it in GPS accounts for a magnetic declination. So everybody uses the WMM very frequently all the time without even knowing it. We can control our attitude, not just sense it, we control it using torque rods or magnet torquers. These are just ferromagnetic cores. They're just little iron rods, not always iron. And then you wrap a wire around it and you run a uh, current through that wire and that induces a magnetic torque in this magnetic field. It is not nearly as strong as um, say 
reaction wheels, but you can desaturate your reaction wheels. Or uh, if you've if you've wound up reaction wheels one way, you can wind it back the other way. I think that's um, that that's in a moment. Uh, so I'll, I'll save that. So, what's important about these sensors? The the backwards generator. Um, that's not a bad way to say it. Yeah, you put electricity in, you get the magnetism out. That's not a bad way to say it at all. Um, that's, a good, that's a very good question. If I don't see these questions, please yell at me. Um, there's several sensors you can use. Now, the best one, the one that is the most expensive and the most useful is a star tracker. It has a star map inside it. It takes a picture of the of space, and then it knows exactly where it is and what direction it's looking at. And that gives you a full quaternion because it looks at multiple stars. It gets two vectors, and you need two vectors to generate a full quaternion and then gives you that full quaternion. It tells you where you're looking at and how fast you're rotating. A sun sensor just looks at where the sun is in terms of azimuth and elevation. And so that is gonna give you one vector. You cannot get a full quaternion from one vector. You get a half quaternion there. So you need multiple sensors in order to get a full quaternion and a sun sensor, just one, won't do it. Inertial measurement units, IMUs, if you're rotating, it can tell you how fast you're rotating and that gives you the rotation rates for those Euler angles that we talked about before. And that's kind of why aircraft use them a lot. Um, it, it, it helps in that integration. Magnetometers, like we said, if you bring the IGRF or world magnetic model, you can, measure where that is and you're measuring where the field lines are so that's how you get that one angle you're you're aligning where is that field line so it doesn't give you the full thing but it it does give you a full quaternion if you have three of them uh finally a horizon sensor it looks for the earth's limb so if you look at earth from space there is that bright edge along where the atmosphere is they call that the limb l-i-m-b and so a horizon sensor measures that limb and gives you one vector so if you have a horizon sensor and a sun sensor you can get a full quaternion if you have um a star tracker, you can get a full quaternion. You just need to know what sensors do I need? And if my star tracker dies, how am I going to figure out what that quaternion is? Okay. So let's talk about attitude control. So the first thing is reaction wheels. Reaction wheels are very common, and that's what you're going to see in this video. So what you're going to see is, is this on an air table and the reaction wheels are being controlled with that uh, a proportional and derivative controller to turn it a certain direction. So as the wheels start spinning faster or slower, they are working together to induce a rotation in the spacecraft. And so in space, whenever they want to turn, this is what it looks like. This is how they're figuring out where they want to go. So you measure, what am I looking at? And then you bring with you a library that tells you, okay, what time is it and where am I? Okay, the sun is that direction and the earth is that direction. There's a library called the Spice Library that does that really well. So then you can calculate, okay, if I'm looking this way and the sun is that way, I need to turn this much in each axis and then you tell your reaction wheels to do it and they go do that. Torque rods, those magnet torquers, those are going to do the same thing, just a lot slower with less control authority. You can have a propulsive reaction, reaction control system, which is whenever you see little bursts of propellant going out, um, that's, that's your reaction control system. Or you can use thrust vector control and propulsion, which is directing which rocket engine is pointing which direction, that kind of thing. Any questions here? All right, calculator time. So don't do that. Uh, let's talk about sizing reaction wheels. This is an important calculation. Let's do it pretty quickly. So all of the calculations are laid out below. I'll give you a hint. You really only need to do one of these. So this, it, it has to do with um, the 1 12th. It just comes from math of calculating moment of inertia. But you're going to take the CubeSat mass and 
subtract out your deployed mass. So this is just a singular structure. It does not include your deployed solar arrays. So 25 kilograms, which is just the max for 12U dispensers, minus an assumed 1.5 kilograms for your solar arrays, which for expensive ones is pretty high. So you have 23.5. And these are the dimensions of the spacecraft. A 12U extended version is 226 millimeters by 226 millimeters by 366 millimeters. So what is this value? Point three six. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So there's that point three six that you just calculated. Let's include the parallel axis theorem from our good friend Huygens. So we took out that one point five. So we are going to calculate uh, the the plus mass times distance squared. That's that parallel axis theorem. So this gives you based on remember how we said it's a little bit harder to turn things that are much farther out. So this right here is assuming that you have solar is deployed in each direction, which isn't exactly smart, but you need you just need to know what's your farthest direction. We're looking for the maximum uh, total mass moment of inertia. So it's just this top one that matters. Point three eight. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty close, but you get that point three eight. That point. This is this is the number I got, and you assume what is my maximum rotation rate gonna be? Because you can control your rotation rates uh, separately, um, you know, like they did in that video. But when you're tumbling, you need to be able to dampen that tumbling out and then desaturate your reaction wheels, which just means that you they spin up and they spin up and they spin up, and eventually you could put more power into them, but they're not gonna go any faster. So then you need to use your torque rods to rotate your body in a different way, and then slowly de-spin those reaction wheels down, and you don't spin them all the way down to zero because they get a little bit squirrely there. You'll spin them down to about 100, 150 RPM. So if I've assumed a maximum rotation rate of five degrees per second, I turn that into radians. So I take that radian and multiply it by that maximum total mass moment of inertia. And what is that value? It's just the, the 0.38 multiplied by this maximum rotation rate. 0 0.033. So yeah, it's 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 really, really small because um, you're gonna have that 0 0.0873 times this 0.337. Let me make sure I got that right. 0.8, so it's three times 0 0.37735. So that's gonna be that 0 0.031. So that is in, the units of newton meters second and here's that conversion into that uh, that's generally the way this is expressed and people will often express this in millinewton meter second so that's about 31.6 millinewton meter second and so if you go to reaction wheel data sheets they'll tell you what that newton meter second value is so if you add on some kind of safety factor say two times then I'm going to need something with at least 63 millinewton seconds in order to rotate the spacecraft five degrees per second. All right. So let's talk about the EPS. We're getting to the end here. 
Uh, we're gonna, there's, there's uh, one more calculation in this. We're gonna talk about power generation, distribution, and consumption. So there's a lot of different ways these things can take form, um, but photovoltaic systems generally have batteries with the management system. They have maximum power point trackers, which convert that photovoltaic energy into usable energy for the spacecraft. And then you have DC to DC conversion. So your satellite components are generally gonna take either 3.3, 5, and 12 volts, Sometimes if you have really high powered things, you'll go up to 28 volts, but the higher the voltage you go, the more susceptible to radiation damage you are. So those are the three that we're going to really talk about. Here's a visualization of what those look like. So you have your solar panels over here on the left and each one of those, not each, but you divide them up along multiple MPPTs. You have some controller that controls all these. Battery management determines charge, the current and voltage of each battery and the temperature of the battery is really important. And then you convert that voltage here into whatever your subsystems need. And there, at every one of these points, there are losses. So those losses are pretty dramatic, and you're going to see that here in these calculations. Some TPMs here. The minimum power margin is you're just comparing what is the maximum power consumption at the worst power state of the system, less the uh, or, or it's the maximum generation or minimum generation less the maximum consumption. That the conversion efficiency, remember there's lots of losses here, so you're gonna need to reduce this as much as possible. Battery capacity is, is really important because you can only use about 65% of the battery. Lithium ion batteries are the most common in space and they don't like to get below 20% or above 85%. So you need to bring a lot more batteries than you think you do because you can only use that 65% of it or else your batteries are gonna die really quickly. You need to know how long it's going to take to charge them, and that has to do with how much excess power you're generating. You need to know how long it's going to take for the EPS to turn on the rest of the spacecraft, because the EPS is what gets shut down and it gets brought back online before the uh, onboard computer does. If you are generating more power than you need and your batteries are full, Oftentimes, they will disconnect the solar array from the rest of the spacecraft. So it's not a closed loop anymore, so it doesn't generate electricity. Then you also are going to reconnect it once your batteries have used up some of their power. But you can't do that too often or else you'll be switching constantly. So this is that battery issue. Um, building EPS, the, they fail. A lot of EPSs fails. The majority is flight software and EPS failures kill these spacecraft, especially university class spacecraft. Uh, arcing happens quite a bit. You can conformally coat um, printed circuit boards, effectively just preventing arcing up to about 5,900 volts, but it, it's still a problem. Solar arrays, as we talked about earlier, they will generate less power at the end of life than they did at the beginning. The batteries have a very tight thermal window. They don't like to be above 25 or 50 or below 15. So that's that's difficult. Um, you have that 20 to 85 problem and you have massive efficiency losses. So with all these combined, you can see this is really where a lot of the spacecraft fail. Um, there is a, a, I won't name names, but there was a satellite out of uh, Georgia Tech who make phenomenal satellites. This is no fault of them. And Nanorax had to go through this awful procedure because the satellite was pointing lasers at this, um, this prism and they were afraid it was going to hit the International Space Station. So every branch of the military got involved. And then it went up into the, they finally got it up uh, into orbit and it took them years to get approved and it orbited for a couple times and the battery died and they never heard from it again. So you got to check the EPS very, very carefully. Um, this is how much power is available at different planets. So we talked about at Earth, you get 1366 watts per meter squared, and that's electromagnetic radiation. So it counts as both uh, heat and as power flux. It's the same thing. But you can see at, at Earth, it's 1366, and you can generate more power at Venus. At Mars, yeah, you can still use photovoltaic systems. It's not going to be nearly as much. But around Jupiter, you have to use a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. You, you have to have a non-photovoltaic power system, or else you're not going to do well. Um, so let's talk about power generation. 
your power generation is going to be a function of that 1366 value. So just the, the radiation flux coming from the sun in that visible spectrum. And you're going to have some solar cell that has some efficiency. And here, we're not assuming the radiation absorptivity is 1. We're going to call it 0.85 here. If the solar cells get hot, they don't work as well. So that's a 0.88 there, some losses. And we've just assumed a 0.5 meter squared solar array. So this is just the total cell sum area and an angle of incidence. So we are slightly pointed away from the sun by five degrees. So tell me, how much power are we generating? I got 163.8 watts. Yep, 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 yep. All right, so let's just call that a clean 164. So then you have to talk about uh, distribution. So this, this actually involves both getting it across the maximum power point trackers and also distribution to the rest of the spacecraft. And this is losses associated with those. So we haven't got past the DC to DC converters yet, but we're gonna talk about all the distribution losses here. So you're effectively just multiplying uh, an efficiency for diodes and, and uh, power lines uh, going through headers, and this is also the efficiency for the maximum power point tracker, which is a DC to DC converter. And then we're going to put a margin on that as well. So what is the distribution availability? Ninety nine point six. Yeah, uh, let me make sure I got that right. Point nine, point nine times point seven five. And yeah, 99.6. So we might call that a clean 100. So power consumption is on the other end. So we've looked at generating power and distributing it, but now we're gonna look at consuming power and what that looks like. So I've just assumed that the worst case power consumption, continuous, not pink, uh, peak is 50 watts, okay? Now that 50 watts has to go through the DC to DC converters, the things that get it to 3.3, 5, and 12 volts. So that, uh, is, that's 0.75. Those DC to DC converters have a really bad efficiency. And we need to put a 1 point to 20% margin on this as well. So what is the total power consumption here? The 80 watts. 80 watts. So we at first were generating 164, 100, yeah, 164 watts. But after you take into account distribution losses and consumption losses, it's not, it's not 160 minus 50, it's 99.6 minus 80. So it is, you have to generate way more power than you think you do to be safe here. And the EPS is regularly where this fails. So if you don't have enough power, you can make, you can add solar panels with more solar cells. You can try and get more efficient uh, components because all those components have their own power conversion efficiencies. So you provide it, you know, 20 watts, but it only needs 18 watts and two watts goes out as heat. So if you get a better power conversion efficiency, you don't need as much for heat. Uh, you can decrease that angle of incidence. So you go from uh, cosine of five degrees to cosine of zero, uh, or you can increase those solar cell efficiencies. And I got to tell you, it doesn't get better than 0 0.322 that we were using the top of the line efficiency right there. Um, so there were a lot of margins built in, but this is how you calculate it safely. Any questions on EPS? This is the last section. Okie doke. So there's two main parts. You have your operating system and a flight software framework. And both of these things have to facilitate all of the things, the behavior, the stuff that the spacecraft has to do. So in terms of software modes, there's a couple different modes, and this can be broken down in a variety of ways. But first, you have deployment. This is a sequential operation. I get deployed from the spacecraft. I'm going to detumble the spacecraft so I, I know exactly I'm not rotating. My IMUs are registering low. I'm going to deploy my solar arrays, and that's going to make me tumble a little bit more. So I'm going to detumble there. 
I'm going to initialize all my systems. I'm going to check them out. I'm going to make sure everything's good. I'm going to uh, point towards the sun. I'm going to make sure I'm power positive. And then when I'm good, I go into idle mode. And this idle mode in launch and early operations is going to just wait for the right communications period. So it has schedules for when it can communicate. And so it points the antenna towards the ground control station after it's charged up its batteries. And then it starts communicating. That lasts for about six to nine minutes around this altitude. And then uh, you go back into idle until... Uh, you kind of repeat this until the ground says, okay, you're good to start doing the stuff that you were really supposed to be doing. A lot of times, if you have a science instrument, there'll be a commissioning phase. So you'll take data with the science instrument, and then you might calculate what the noise floor is, and then you'll upload that noise floor and remove that from the data. And you keep going like that until everything is commissioned, you are good, and then you are ready to start doing whatever the satellite uh, says it's supposed to. If you need to desaturate your reaction wheels, oftentimes that's its own software mode. Um, safety one is for error detection. Let's say we get too hot or too cold. We're going to turn stuff off. We're going to focus on heating things up. And then when we get better, we will go back into normal operation. But if we detect an error, and error detection and error correction need to be completely decoupled, that's very, very important because more than one thing might be wrong and you don't want to just try and solve the problem and more things go wrong. So if that doesn't work, if you still can't fix the problem autonomously, go into safety two, which is I need help. I can't fix this on my own. I need the ground control station to tell me what to do. The real kicker is that safety two can't be contingent on G and N C components working. So that makes it really difficult to point at the earth with your antennas and also antennas the radio takes a lot of power to run so it's a very difficult problem and not a lot of satellites come out of this so you really you don't like to be in this there's also a contingency mode for if things go wrong during deployment uh and then this dormancy mode is really your eps has a kill switch which if it's plugged in it just doesn't uh, it doesn't allow a lot of things to happen. So the flight software says, okay, this kill switch is involved. I am not going to start going into idle. I'm just going to run diagnostics and report data back to whoever's asking. So that's a, a separate mode. So there's two kinds of operating systems. There's general purpose operating systems, which we're all using right now, I think. And then there's real time operating systems. So GPOS that is Windows, Mac, the, the iOS, and Linux. These will give lots of time to lots of different processes all at once. You are running Zoom, but you might be running Excel or Microsoft Word or something in the background, or you have some stupid Windows executive that's doing something stupid in the background. I don't love Windows. Um, Real-time operating systems have one thing. It does one thing and it takes a specific amount of time, and you know exactly what is happening and how long it's gonna take. So that is really powerful with spacecraft because you can assign priority levels to different threats, to different things that have to happen. Um, there's a couple different options. Uh, Artems is a good one. Uh, we use free RTOS on our spacecraft. VX works. This is what like the Mars rovers are going to use these. This is top of the line, and it is extremely expensive. That uh, that two hundred grand comes with a lot of time with the the people who operate VXWorks. They'll teach people how to use it, so it's not just a license. You're getting a lot for that, but it's not for the layperson for sure. Um, there's three options for a flight software framework. You can build it from scratch, which is dumb. A lot of lot of a lot of programs do that and it's not it's not the most brilliant way to go about this you can repurpose previously existing software which is you know oh i had this satellite that did something similar i'll just repurpose it and change some stuff which is not ideal but it does work a lot or finally you can use a modular framework and there's two big ones from nasa cfs core flight system and f prime I'm a big proponent of F prime. That's what we use on the spacecraft. It's incredible. It's what's running the Mars Ingenuity helicopter. 
Asteria used it. Neo Scout and Lunar Ice Cube are both using it. They're both about to launch or either already have launched. I think they're about to launch. Uh, but these had about, I think Neo Scout had 310,000 lines of code and Lunar Ice Cube had about like 350, 360,000 lines of code. But out of the 310,000, only 6% of it was handwritten. And out of the 350, 11% of it was handwritten. So you're getting incredible functionality. And if you need 300,000 lines of code to run a good spacecraft, why would you build it yourself? That's painful. Okay. So this is some examples of what F prime looks like. This is from a very simple math tutorial, um, but it's still pretty cool. So this is just your, your basic ground uh, deployment system. Um, you can see up there at the top, commanding it, what events happen, what channels you have, if you're uplinking or downlinking. Um, data dictionaries are important. This has a poly DB and a parameter database. So that's good. Um, this is if you are uploading a value or giving some argument to some function. Uh, this is what it looks like. And then when certain events have happened, uh, they are logged in this, this event log. And uh, it tells you exactly what time it is. The op, uh, I think that event ID is an op code. Um, but it tells you exactly what's going on. And if you build it yourself, you don't have this functionality. And there's, of course, severities that can be associated with this. And these severities can be created for any given subsystem. Uh, here are some of those software subsystems. So these are not the modes. These are how it's kind of organized. You have power management, which just tells things to turn on or turn off, uh, which is, of course, the command and data handling. The onboard computer is turning on power transistors. It's providing a signal to the base of a power transistor, which lets power flow through that transistor. A mode management tells you which command sequences you should be executing. So are you in idle? Are you in communications? Are you in desaturation or safety? That kind of thing. Thermal control is like a thermostat for the satellite. It If it, you tell the satellite what temperature you want it to be, and if it gets colder, it's going to turn the heat on. Cool. Um, TTNC or, or communications uh, is just organizing the downlink and facilitating that. Fault protection has to do with radiation damage um, that that is a little bit complicated but it's it's fixing those bits and if the watchdog timer happens it'll just that don't even involve the flight software but if certain kind of hangs happen if it gets caught there are ways you can get around that and fault protection handles those the phm the prognostic health management subsystem this is safety this is what is checking to make sure everything's going on correctly this is making sure that um, things that are supposed to be happening are happening, and if if things are not going correctly, then time time to make a change, go into safety one, try and fix it. Engineering, this this showed up on a couple satellites. This is kind of a catch-all subsystem. If you have in-house developed subsystems that are producing data that the CNDH subsystem does not directly understand or it needs some kind of translation, this is where that's going to happen. So a lot of the catch-all stuff that doesn't fit neatly with anything else, it can go in here, and there's, there's a variety of ways to do it. Finally, payload, whatever you want it to do, it depends on the purpose of the satellite. Three big things that the software has to have to work correctly. Bulletproof safe mode. You have to shoot it with every kind of possible error. You need to inject faults. You need to make all kinds of things go wrong. And then when you're done with it, you need to give it to your buddy who has no idea what they're doing and saying, here, break this. Margaret Hamilton was a, a software engineer for the Apollo program. And she brought her kid into work. And it was a, it was a baby. And the baby started crawling all over the the control board that they had created to get the to uh, simulate the Apollo control structure, and the the baby pressed uh, an order of commands that caused the whole system to fry. It, the whole thing froze up, and so Margaret Hamilton was like, "Wow, we didn't think about this. This needs to go into our manual." So she went to her superiors and said this is a problem we need to identify this and fix it and they said well a baby did that our men astronauts would never do something so stupid they're trained they're dudes so what happened christmas eve on I think it was apollo 15 or something i don't know uh they pressed that sequence whole thing froze up and if 
if Margaret Hamilton had not put a footnote in the operator's manual about this problem, then the astronauts would have died on Christmas. Um, so bulletproof safe mode, you have to understand what's going on. You have to be able to patch things on orbit. Some Your satellite's not going to work the way you think it will. You have to be able to change stuff. You have to be able to update parameters. That's very important. Finally, you got to be able to force the satellite to power down immediately. Whether you're in safety two or TTNC, you have to be able to tell it shut down now. No questions asked, shut down now. Because that's going to flush out the working memory. It's going to power down. And then you can boot it back up and reinitialize that. So those are those are the three big facets of your flight software that you need to get done. Here are some citations. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with this. I appreciate it. And I really hope that you all learned something. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be a part of this program. And uh, not certainly not all of the Spacecraft Seminar Series will be this long. So any, any questions, uh, words of wisdom for us? Parting thoughts, uh, Michael. Thanks for the great presentation. What was the what What are some things that can happen if you are not able to reboot the system immediately? Like that third point. Um, it takes time. So if if you're if you're telling it to reboot, you've generally got a problem. Something is not doing what you want it to. And what safety one does a lot of times is if let's say my G and C components are not working your first when in doubt power cycle right like yo oh, is your computer working turn it back on and off again so tells you the every wire wireless company ever um so you'll shut it down and then if it's still not working you'll shut down the whole spacecraft and turn it back on and that fixes the problem a lot of times but if if you can't shut it down you can't flush that working memory and get it back working again cuz all of your components they don't interact with your boot memory or telemetry memory or configuration memory. They interact with the working memory. And that's the one that you want to shut down and reinitialize. What can happen is when radiation strikes the spacecraft, you can get a hard, a destructive error that can't be fixed. So in that case, a zero is going to be a one no matter what, or a one is going to be a zero. But there's nothing that can change that. So... If that happens in the, I'm gonna shut down on my own code, you need some other way to turn it off. That's that's kind of one example, but you gotta be able to shut it down immediately or else you risk a lot of radiation damage that can't be fixed. Gotcha, thank you, that's really interesting. That's a great question. Any more questions? Happy to help. I don't have any questions personally, but definitely do appreciate the seminar today. I feel like it was very detailed, covered a lot of gaps that I had since it's been, what, about six or so months, seven since we had the last one of these? Yeah. Yeah, and this one, this one's going to replace the other one that's that's up there currently. So, um, I like this one better. I, I put a lot of work into fixing some of the misconceptions that I had put in because I'm stupid. But um, <laughs> appreciate appreciate everybody's time. Thank y'all for paying attention, and y'all have a wonderful night. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Michael. Thank Thanks, you. Michael. See ya.